Welcome to the second video on analysis of one-factor experiments. Again, you should at this point have read through the notes on uh, experiments with one-factor part one. And we explained some of the, the background and details in uh, the previous video. And in this case, we're going to uh, talk in depth about the formal analysis of a one-factor experiment. And this leads us to what's called analysis of variance or ANOVA. And in the case where there is a single factor, it is referred to as one-way analysis of variance. So I'm going to begin by talking about a specific uh, example. And let's make sure that my setup is correct before I go into slideshow. Okay. And in this case, what I want here for a pen, we're going to use another case study. Uh, this one has to do with an experiment uh, studying the impact of different phosphor coatings on the performance of compact fluorescent lamps. So in this case, there are three types of coatings, as you can see in the diagram. And for each type of coating, there are five replicate bulbs that have been manufactured. And these have all been done in some random order. Okay. So we're interested in seeing if there are differences between the coatings in terms of their average uh, output or luminosity. And again, within each coating, we have five replicates. The differences in those replicates is considered noise, or Fisher would say experimental error. There is no explanation for this variation within each group, but it's just naturally how these bulbs vary uh, at random. So what we want to do is separate out the variation we may have caused by using different coatings from the variation that is simply noise, the variation within the groups. So we sometimes say we want to separate the variation between, that is, between the groups, from the variation within the groups, which represent noise. Okay. So we quickly show an analysis on uh, slide 23, again, these are the part one notes for one factor experiments. Okay, the grand average is 5,722 lumens. And then you can see that the from the uh, plot, you can see the overall averages for each of the uh, coding types. <clears throat> and remember that the tau's in our uh, simple linear model, and they're given here, represent the shift, the mean shift in the response as we go from one phosphor type to another. And these shifts are measured with respect to the grand average. Okay. So here we see t for uh, coding number one, there's an overall shift of positive 114 lumens. For phosphor coating 2, there's a downward shift of minus 144 lumens. And for 3, there's an upward shift of 30 lumens. You add these up, they sum to 0. Remember, they have to sum to zeros because they are shifts up and down about their overall grand average. Okay. So uh, later, we'll go back and do the analysis in jump, but it's very similar to the uh, previous analysis with the meat wrapping data. But what we want to do, as I indicated, is we want to find a way to separate the noise. That is the variation within each group. By the way, later in the course, that within variation, we'll refer to as pure error because it's purely random. There is no assignable cause for it. We don't know why the five lamps vary within each of the groups. We want to separate that out from the between variation. That is the variation 
between the groups and we'll measure that variance in terms of differences in the mean response. Okay, so this was Fisher's challenge uh, when he first developed these methods, is how could we go about separating the two types of variation? And Fisher's solution, uh, well, he wasn't the first to think of it, but he formalized it, was something we call analysis of variance, or ANOVA, and what it amounts to is partitioning the variation in each response into two parts. It's actually algebraically very simple to do. Okay? So one part we'll call the between variation, and the second part we'll call the within or noise variation. And to give you a simple example, I pick one of the uh, observations. So Y11, that means okay, coding 1, replicate 1. So the total variation with respect to the grand average is 128 lumens, and we can break that into two parts. A part that is due to the uh, coding type itself, 114 lumens, and a second part which is the natural variation okay, within the coding. Notice that the noise variation okay, is calculated as the deviation of that observation from its own mean. That is, within each group, the noise is measured by how the observations naturally vary about their own average for that group. And you can see the partition works, and it's actually a really simple calculation. Okay. So for the lumens data, the sl on slide 26, we show uh, the breakdown. Okay. So we have one column that gives us all the measured observations. Another column gives us the averages for each group, and again, there are only three averages the overall grand average, okay, and then the next column over, okay, this is the within variation. So think of the column y sub i j minus y bar i. y bar i is the average for that group, okay. So that measures the deviations within each group, okay. So the first five measurements represent the variation within group one. By the way, if you add up those deviations, they'll add, uh, come up or add to zero because once again, they're, they're variations about their own average, y bar i. Again, you go down and you'll see the same thing for all five. Within each group, all of those deviations would sum to zero. So that's the within variation. Okay. The next group over measures the between variation. This is measured as the difference between the group average, y bar i, and the grand average. Okay. Notice there are only three unique values because there are only three averages. But for accounting purposes, we have to keep track of um, that variation for all 15 of the responses. By the way, notice if you add up those three deviations, once again they sum to zero because they're, they're showing the deviations above and below their average, which is the grand average. Okay. And then finally the next column over is the overall variation for each observation. And as I'll explain in a moment, the next three columns are those deviations squared, which is what we need to actually measure the between and within variation. Okay. Okay. So what we basically do is we take each deviation and square it. Okay. And it turns out that if we add up the squared deviations, okay, we find out that the sum of squares total equals the sum of squares between 
plus the sum of squares within. Okay, this is a very important result and a key to understanding how ANOVA works. Okay, so if we were to go back and we look at these columns, okay, these last three uh, rightmost columns, okay, they are the sum of the squared deviations. And you're thinking, well, why do we have to square them? Well, if you look at all three of the columns that I've circled, the uh, within, between, and overall uh, variation, look at the bottom. The deviations all sum to zero. So basically, uh, since these are all deviations about averages, they sum to zero. Therefore, I don't have a meaningful way to compare or measure the variation. So what we typically do, we just square them. So notice, we can sum up the squared deviations. And as I showed on the next slide, these uh, sum of squares add up. Okay. So the sum of squares total is equal to the sum of squares between plus the sum of squares within. This is what we want. We've now partitioned the variation that occurs between the groups. Okay. That's a measure of potential uh, cause and effect, that is variation caused by the coatings from the variation within. That is the noise or experimental error. That is a measure of how much the uh, output of these lamps varies naturally on its own. So you need to understand this idea of sum of squares total, sum of squares between, plus sum of squares within, because that is right at the heart of how we determine whether or not our experimental factor or factors have an important effect on the response. Okay. And I'm going to skip through a couple of slides. I just show why, indeed, these sum of squares add up. And at the bottom of slide 29, again, this is the takeaway, the key result. Okay. So the between variation, and there are ver different names for it, but factor variation or between variation, and sometimes Jump will call it model variation is a signal measure. And this is exactly how Fisher thought of it. It's a signal as to whether or not there are real differences between the settings of our experimental factor. And the within variation is a noise measure. It's exactly what it is. The variation within the replicates for each group is noise. So what we're looking for as a signal to noise ratio is, we would like the signal compared to the noise to be large. So if the variation between the groups is much larger than the noise or natural variation in the lamps, this suggests that there are real differences between our coding levels. Okay. So there is one issue, though, in how do we make the comparisons. It turns out that each of those three sums of squares is based upon what we call a different number of degrees of freedom. Okay, this is usually introduced in, in, in statistics when we talk about uh, the sample variance. The degrees of freedom are nothing more than the number of freely varying observations that are used to calculate a statistic. Okay. So typically, the overall degrees of freedom, that is to calculate the sum of squares total, is n minus 1. n is the total number of observations. The experimental error is based upon n minus a, where a is the number of levels of the factor. Okay. These are the degrees of freedom for error. And then the degrees of freedom between are simply a minus 1, where again, a is the number of levels of the factor. And just like these sums of squares add up, the degrees of freedom add up. So let me go back to my table I showed you earlier. 
notice, again, when we look at this table, I'm going to, we'll see, for instance, let's pick the middle one. Okay. So right here, y bar i minus the grand average, which we represent by y double bar, sums to zero. Remember, these sums of squares are not based on the original data. They're based upon the deviations. So notice that they sum to zero. So if I know any of the two deviations, I automatically know the third. So for instance, if I know coding 1 has a deviation of 114, and coding 2 has a deviation of minus 144, then I automatically know the third deviation is 30 because they sum to zero. So we say there is two degrees of freedom, A minus 1. Well, what about the column to the left? This is the within deviation. Within each group of five, they sum to zero. So if you tell me any four of the deviations, I know the third. So if you took the first, let's say, four deviations, we'll look at group one, you added them up, they'd add up to 36. Well, how do I know that? Because the fifth deviation is minus 36, and they have to sum to zero. So within each group, literally, there are four degrees of freedom to measure the sum of squares within. Four unique deviations. The fifth one within each group is redundant. Okay. So for the sum of squares within, there's 12 degrees of freedom. Okay. For the sum of squares between, there are two degrees of freedom. And for the grand average, the overall sum of squares, there are 14. How do I know that? Again, I have 15 deviations. Pick any 14, sum them up, and I automatically know what the 15th is because they sum to zero. So only 14 of these deviations can be unique. So we call these the degrees of freedom available to measure each of the sums of squares. And in general, degrees of freedom are the number of unique or freely varying observations used to calculate a statistic. Okay. Since each of these sums of squares is based upon a different degrees of freedom, they literally are based upon a total of differing numbers of observations. So we can't compare them. Think of it this way. Suppose we were measuring something you know, like uh, diameters of uh, ball bearings. So you measure, and we pick a random sample. You pick five. I pick 10 ball bearings, and we measure the diameters. You add up your five measurements, and then I add up my 10 measurements. Well, my 10 measurements are always going to sum to a higher number than yours because you only had five measurements. So if you wanted to, com we wanted to compare our two measurements, I think if you thought about it for a minute, you'd say, well, take an average. And that's what we do. We find the average variation. And Fisher called these the mean squares. They're basically just the average squares or average variance for each of the components. In other words, what they are, really are are the variances, the measured variation for each component. Since the mean squares okay, have been adjusted for the different degrees of freedom, we can compare them. And the only two we really care about is the mean square between okay, and the mean square error, the signal to the noise. So you take the sum of squares total divide by the degrees of freedom, it gives you the mean square. Okay? And the mean square error is important. And oh, by the way, this turns out to be nothing more than the sample variance of the response.
Again, variance is how we measure noise or random variation. So what we're going to do is compare these two quantities, okay, the mean square between to the mean square error. Again, this was Fisher's idea. And that ratio is a signal to noise ratio. So the larger the signal to noise ratio, the more likely that that factor, whatever your experimental factor is, has had a real impact on the response because the variation we see between the levels of that factor is gr much greater or significantly greater than the noise in the system. And then comes the question though, well how large is, should a ratio be? Well in theory it's a signal to noise ratio so the lowest value this ratio can have is 1. Now in actual practice because of random variation uh, in our samples you can actually get a calculated F ratio less than 1 but in theory uh, the true signal to noise ratio can't go below 1. So a small, so you could think of 1 as sort of a baseline. So if that ratio was 1 or less, there's absolutely no evidence of uh, significant variation being caused by changing the factor levels because what we have observed is no different than the noise. So Fisher had to have a way to evaluate uh, this ratio and this is sometimes called an F test or an F ratio and F stands for Fisher and to do that he developed what is called the F probability distribution or Fisher's distribution. Okay. So that ratio the mean square between to the mean square error okay, under the assumption the null hypothesis is correct that is the null hypothesis of no uh, treatment effects, no experimental effects. Under that assumption, that F ratio uh, randomly behaves according to Fisher's F distribution. So what we typically do for the given uh, example, we find the 95th percentile of the associated F distribution and then we compare our F ratio to that a particular percentile. If our ratio exceeds that percentile, we reject the null hypothesis. So that percentile serves as a threshold for a significant signal to noise ratio. And basically Fisher's um, F distribution, as you can see on slide 35, has a right skewed distribution and the shape of it is based upon two parameters and we see them here as subscripts. Okay. And what those parameters are, the first one is the degrees of freedom to estimate the numerator, the second is the degrees of freedom to estimate the denominator. Okay. So degrees of freedom to use to estimate mean square between versus the, green, the degrees of freedom to es estimate the uh, mean square error or within variation. Okay. So again, under the assumption the null hypothesis is true, the F ratio follows this distribution. Okay. And we won't really uh, bother with it, but traditionally you would have to go to tables of the F distribution and look up the particular percentile. Okay, So basically what you're looking at, the rows represent the degrees of freedom denominator and the columns the degrees of freedom numerator Okay, for what we're trying to estimate. So basically in our particular case the degrees of freedom for the denominator are two and the degrees of freedom for the numerator are 12. So our, our percentile, and this is the 95th percentile, is 3.89. If our F ratio, 
exceeds 3.89, we will reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Okay. So, on slide 38, I show the experimental results. Again, we'll do this in jump in a moment. So we have the mean square between the mean square error representing noise. The null hypothesis is that there are no differences between the three groups in mean response. And then notice the alternative. It's, it's a bit unsatisfying, and we're going to come back to this in a future section. The alternative, if we reject the null, we simply say at least two of the groups may be different. It does not tell us which groups are different. It just says two groups are different. So our observed F ratio is nearly 33. The cutoff for rejecting the null hypothesis is around 3.9. Therefore, we overwhelmingly reject the null hypothesis. Our F ratio is far greater than what we would expect in the case where the null hypothesis is true. Therefore, our F ratio is so large, there really must be differences between those phosphor coating types. Okay. And then all of this is typically summarized together into what's called an ANOVA table, one of the creations of R.A. Fisher. Okay. So for the phosphor data, we simply look at the table. So we have the source of the variation. Here, coding would be between. Error variation or within variation. Degrees of freedom. Sums of squares the mean squares, and the F ratio. Okay. So this is a nice, neat summary of the results. Okay. So let's go ahead and to go ahead and bring up the jump software. And here is the phosphor coding data. So once again, we will go to analyze fit y by x. So phosphor coating is X, and lumens is the response. Okay. So we get our scatter plot. Okay. So I click on the red arrow and select ANOVA. And down below, we get the complete breakdown in the ANOVA table. Okay. Notice that we're also given the average for each group, the standard error. Remember, the standard error is the standard deviation of a mean. So in this particular case, the standard error okay, is nothing more than the um, square root of the variance. By the way, this is called the root mean square error. What is that? That's just S, the sample variance. Okay. And you divide that by the square root of 5. That's the standard error. And you can use the T distribution to calculate 95% um, confidence intervals for the theoretical means for each group. And by the way, jump gives them to you above. The vertical uh, tips of the diamonds are the 95% confidence intervals. Notice in particular that the confidence interval for phosphor coating 2 does not overlap at all with the confidence intervals for 3 and for 1. This would indicate to us that the real mean uh, output of the lamps for phosphor coating 2 is substantially smaller than that for coating types 1 and 3. And again, you can see this down below if you look at 2. You can see the confidence interval for 2 does not overlap with 1 and 3. Okay. Again, we'll be doing more with these analysis as we go further into the course.